Hey there, this is James Carberry, founder of Sweetfish Media and one of the co-hosts of this show. For the last year and a half, I've been working on my very first book. In the book, I share the three-part framework we've used as the foundation for our growth here at Sweetfish. Now, there are lots of companies that have raised a bunch of money and have grown insanely fast, and we featured a lot of them here on the show. We've decided to bootstrap our business, which usually equates to pretty slow growth. But using the strategy outlined in the book, we're on pace to be one of Inc.'s fastest growing companies in 2020. The book is called Content-Based Networking, How to Instantly Connect with Anyone You Want to Know. If you're a fan of audiobooks like me, you can find the book on Audible, or if you like physical books, you can also find it on Amazon. Just search content-based networking or James Carberry, C-A-R-B-A-R-Y in Audible or Amazon, and it should pop right up. All right, let's get into the show. Hey everybody, Logan with Sweetfish here. As we've been doing all month long, we continue our countdown today of the top 20 episodes of 2019. Coming in at number six is a conversation with Lisa Walker over at Fuse on building an effective work from anywhere culture. To get more episodes coming up in the countdown, make sure you're subscribed to the show in Apple Podcasts or wherever you do your listening. You can also check out the full list at sweetfishmedia.com slash blog. Just look for the hashtag best of 2019 in the categories on the right-hand side of that page. Welcome back to the B2B Growth Show. I'm your host for today's episode, Logan Lyles with Sweetfish Media. I'm joined today by Lisa Walker. She is the Vice President of Brand and Corporate Marketing at Fuse. Lisa, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks so much for having me, Logan. I appreciate it. Oh, we appreciate you making some time to join us. Well, Lisa, we're going to be talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, you know, work is is not a place anymore. The, the the future of work and and running a remote team poses a lot of opportunities and challenges. So we're going to be breaking down, you know, some ideas about that, where things are headed, and what we can do about it. Um, and as a member of a remote team myself, uh, very passionate about this topic. Before we jump straight into that, though, I would love for you to share with listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, your history in marketing, and what you and your team at Fuse are up to these days. Sure. So as you mentioned, I'm here at Fuse now, but I've been in B2B brand and marketing for longer than I care to admit, uh, both in (laughs) publishing and then in the tech industry. So before Fuse, I was actually at Forrester Research for several years doing brand and marketing there. I think one really important thing to know before we jump in is that I'm a working mom of two boys which was a huge factor in me choosing to come work for Fuse and and come help build the brand here. Um, Fuse is a cloud software company. So what we've built here is a communications and collaboration platform that gives people the ability to call, meet, chat, and share content through one single application across any device they choose. Um, Just as a contrast to that, at my last company, I did those things across six different applications for voice video (laughs) messaging. (laughs) Yeah, it's a lot, right? And I I mean, I'm sure you have, you probably have four of your own as we're talking here. Mm -hmm. Um, And that created a ton of friction, frankly, for me and lost a lot of time as I was trying to work. I had a distributed team across, I think, four different countries during my time at Forrester. So it turns out that six applications in an organization is typical. And that's actually the average we see with the companies that we're working with, where we're coming in and displacing those applications and bringing in one unified app for voice video messaging. So that, that's sort of the average situation we walk into where you've got six applications or more and we're coming in and bringing it all into one. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I can totally relate to that, you know, as being part of a remote team, as being a millennial who's an early adopter. You know, I can remember early on I had not necessarily talking about communication here, but file storage. I had a, I had OneDrive, I had a Box, I had Dropbox, I had Google Drive. I'm like, hold on a second. I, I'm, I'm spreading myself uh, too thin as I try out, you know, these different applications for different things, whether that's communication or file sharing, those sorts of things. So I can totally relate to that. And that's kind of eye-opening there that, you know, the average of uh, six apps for communication and collaboration is kind of the average for organizations these days. And I think that leads nicely into the first thing that you wanted to touch on is that, you know, really when we look at communication and we look at work, uh, it's transformed from a place that we go to what we do, right? It has. And I think, you know, if you think back to, I, I can think back to my first couple jobs, Work was a much more formal setting for me, starting out sort of as an information worker. 
there was a set schedule. There was very little flexibility. I certainly didn't, certainly didn't feel like there was a culture of flexibility. But frankly, with the tools we have today, that that's changed. So it's not just about the fact that you can work from different places, but also you can work during different times and those times when you're most productive. And, and we didn't have the tech to do that before. So we did a survey on this. I think it was two years ago, 6,000 information workers globally, and 50% told us they would move to another company if it meant more flexibility, and that was without a pay increase. And 18% said they would take a pay cut or demotion to gain that flexibility. So that's, that was really interesting to us. And when we dug in, flexibility wasn't about where I work from. That was one factor. But the other thing that was just as important to people was when I work. So that's sort of the new frontier. It's not just about being able to work remotely. It's mm-hmm. about being able to work different hours if those are the hours where I'm most productive. Yeah, yeah. Wow, those are eye-opening statistics, Lisa. Um, so as we look at, as as leaders of teams think about this, Lisa, what are some of the things that you guys have uncovered about how we can implement these different work mode policies of when and where we work effectively? Yeah, so I think first I would say that having a work from home policy or remote work policy is one thing. But if you actually take that to the next level and have what we have at Fuse is a work from anywhere policy. So our chief people officer, Mary Good, put in a work from anywhere policy, which was intentionally flexible. So it's a flexible policy about flexible work is how I would describe it. (laughs) But what it allows you to do as a manager and as an employee is have a conversation about what a personal arrangement looks like for you. That's not you know, these are the different options you have within the company. It's let's sit down as two people and talk about how you can do your best work here. And that's Mm -hmm. about when you do your best work and about where you can do your best work and coming up with these personal arrangements. So just a couple examples. I have a working mom who works for me and she's in the office three days a week. She's at home two days a week. And the day she's in the office, she leaves at 1.30 for school pickup. And then she's back online in the afternoon. I had another woman who worked for me who decided to move to Philadelphia to move in with her boyfriend and we would have lost her. But when we sat down and had that conversation, she's now fully remote from Philadelphia. So I think that having a flexible work policy is great, but actually making that flexible work policy flexible and customizable is -hmm. sort of that next frontier for people. Yeah, what I hear you saying there is is don't start with the company's perspective and come up with these policies of, you know, we allow two days from home or, you know, whatever the standard is, is take an individualized approach and take it from the employee's perspective. What's going to work for you? And, and do we see that as, as a leader uh, for our direct reports? Do we see that as being you know, acceptable? And do we see that as, as working? Uh, do we see that being beneficial for them to be more productive and having an open and frank conversation about it? So I think that's great advice for leaders. For for us who are who are leaders or, or work on a team, we're also then, if we think about it, you know, you mentioned being, being a working mom, we're also dealing with staying present and active when we're working from anywhere. So kind of the flip side of that is once you're in that environment, what are some best practices to actually make yourself productive, to guard your time, those sorts of things, because um, there's benefits, but there's also unique challenges to working from anywhere, right? Well, I think that's a great point. Um, I mean, it's in some ways for us, it views it's a little bit easier because it's contained within one app. So I actually have the ability to control when that app is alerting me and signaling me and trying to kind of push me into work mode. So that that's kind of an easier thing for us, which is lucky for us because we have that technology. But I also think that it's really important for people to create work mode and personal mode. So work mode for me is about being professional and productive outside of the office. And it's a very specific thing. So you need to be able to have the right technology but you also need to be able to curate these environments where you can kind of go into work mode. So mm-hmm. whether that for me, for me, there's a couple of different environments like that, that I've sort of curated over the years. There's a co-working space by my kid's school. So when I have a bunch of school events on a given day, but I also have a bunch of work stuff that I can't move on that day, I will go in and out of that co-working space mm-hmm. so that when I'm in that co-working space, I can be in work mode and I can be productive and I can get those things done. And then when, when I'm at those assemblies, my phone is off the Fuse app is off and I am unreachable during that time as it should Mm -hmm. be. 
And so that's me choosing to go in and out of work and personal mode, but it's much more fluid now. And I think people come in and out of work mode very quickly. So, you know, you come home at night and you want to have dinner with your family. You have to find a way to put those devices away and Mm -hmm. switch out of work mode. But it may be that you've created a flexible schedule with your manager so that you're going to be back online from, you know, nine to 11 at night, because Mm -hmm. that's when you do good work and you should be able to switch back into that. And you should have the tools to do that. That's the tech piece, but you also need to have the right environment to do that. So whether that's, Mm -hmm. you know, the home office environment or whether that's a great coffee shop or whether that's whatever it may be, whatever you've curated Mm -hmm. as those environments where you can kind of switch into work mode and be productive, that's what you need to do. But I do think it's it's about us, you know, if we're going to be more fluid and more flexible in when and where we work, we have to create that work mode and that personal mode. And unfortunately, it's kind of not one size fits all. I mm-hmm. do believe that you have to, same thing, you have to kind of customize that to how you work best. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it comes down to your environment when your energy level is right for different tasks. You know, I found that, you know, pushing, uh, clearing out my inbox to later in the evening when I've got some time, once my kids are asleep is is good. I can't do real high level, you know, long-term strategic creative thinking, but I can plow through some emails at at nine at night, you know, and, and replace that time for being able to spend a little bit more family time at breakfast in the morning and not having to jump in so early. And so, so um, I, I think it's it's kind of this this shifting pieces around that that looks different in the mosaic that you end up putting together, but but there's room to move the tiles around a bit. Uh, so I think that's an important point that you touched on there, and also realizing that. It is fluid as we switch in and out of both modes, but it's not instantaneous. You know, I, I I find myself as a millennial, even though I've heard all the research and I I know it all to be true that we can't multitask. Every time we switch um, tasks, we lose so much productivity. It takes time to regain our focus, but still try to do it. And so I've I've heard a lot of people, um, you know just use the technology to keep technology from distracting us in the way that you're saying in times that you either completely shut off your phone or you change your notification settings in Fuse or Slack or whatever communication app that you're using. And I think those boundaries allow us to switch actually more fluidly than just uh, every you know 30 seconds, 90 seconds, whatever it is. We think that we can switch fluidly that way, but it's more about the boundaries actually make us be able to switch those those modes more fluidly uh, on a regular clip, right? Well, that's true. And I think that then forces you to kind of create some rules of engagement for yourself Mm -hmm. because it is so easy to start checking email in bed Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're deep into it. And now you've, you've kind of lost that personal time of being able to kind of, kind of wind down and, Mm -hmm. and get ready for your sleep. And I think that, So that's not a technology question because like you said, it's all right there and it's at your fingertips. And then it's about you choosing to stay in personal mode when there's some, sometimes there's that draw of, I'll just, I'll just check real quick in case something Mm -hmm. came in because, Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're checking so many things throughout the day and, and we're so kind of addicted to those phones that you can check that one email and then that one email has a problem in it. And now all of a sudden, like you said, you're not just sort of winding down for the night and going through your email, now you're deep into solving a problem and it's 11 o'clock at night and you're then not getting the sleep you need to wake up and be productive the next day. So there is a lot of kind of personal accountability here, I think, Mm -hmm. Um, but for both employees and for managers. So if you're a manager and you have an employee who you don't think is switching in and out of personal and work mode effectively and and you're worried about burnout and those sorts of things, that also has to be part of the conversation. Yeah, I, I saw a great post from Matt Hines the other day on LinkedIn talking about kind of guarding your your direct reports or your colleagues' time in that, you know, we're all working different times. So there's, you know, this asynchronous communication that's happening. And, you know, I, I think this touches on something we're going to get to in a second is culture in a remote environment. But, um, you know, with our team, for instance, you know, James, our founder and I will, you know, I'll, I'll get an email from him, you know, occasionally pretty late at night and he's East Coast time. 
time and I'm mountain time. So then there's also time zone differences. But we, we've we created this working relationship to where, hey, if you get an email from me late at night, it's not that, hey, I expect you to respond at this time. It's just that's when I can get it out. Um, so it's either have, having conversations like that or going back to where I, I started there and got off on a rabbit trail was with Matt's post. He was mentioning, you know, use the send later function um, that that a lot of us have in in our email inbox or with certain tools um, to compose that email at 10 o'clock at night when you're you're plowing through them, but have it send at eight tomorrow morning when you know your colleague's going to be there to try and guard their personal space a little bit. So I think there's a lot of different ways that it can play out, but being conscious of those things help us to then uh, customize it for for us, for our direct reports, and, and for our colleagues. So let's transition there and, and talk a little bit about, you know, managing remote teams and measuring engagement because that's another challenge that comes with this flexibility and this new way of working, right? Sure. Yeah. And we've actually done a bunch of research on this both externally, but also, you know, within our own company and the own experimentation we've been doing with managing such a distributed team. One of the things I think is really interesting is the importance of video meetings. So we know that if a leader turns on video, then it, then the rest of the employees on the call will turn on video as well. So mm-hmm. you can you have to sort of lead by example there. And the nice thing about video is then you're seeing everybody and there is just there's just a more personal connection when you're able to see everyone. Now, what I say to people about video, both for the the manager and for the for the employees on that video call is that it's all about sort of creating the perfect frame. You don't have to have a clean house, but you have to have a clean shot of yourself in the video. So <laughs> there's kind of a personal brand here. If you have a large team on a video conference from around the country or around the world, everyone has that opportunity to sort of present a personal brand moment. That's sort of me mm-hmm. putting my brand hat on. But <laughs> you should be curating just one good frame. Mm-hmm. And there could be chaos around that frame. But mm-hmm. there's an opportunity for you to be consistent on that weekly team call that every time that team call happens and that video flips on, you sort of know what you're getting from people. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what we were talking about when we talk about work mode, right? You have to create environments where you can be productive. And one of those important environments is video. So I think as a manager, it's just really important to have those video meetings. Now, in those video meetings, when you, when you get that group together, start with the personal and start with a few of those conversations that are more personal and then segue into those company updates because remote employees will always talk about how they feel disconnected from HQ Mm -hmm. and disconnected from the company. That's just one of the things you always hear from people who are remote. So you have that opportunity to first make the personal connection and then second, make sure that any of the things they may be hearing about what's going on at the company, that you're getting ahead of those things and giving as transparent as you can, giving a really transparent company update. And then get into the team stuff, but just do those those first two things off the bat to make sure that the team is feeling connected. So that mm-hmm. would be first would be the video. Yeah. Second for yeah. me is chat. I mean, you talked a little bit about chat earlier. Some people do it over Slack. We obviously here do it over Fuse. There's lots mm-hmm. of different chat tools out there, but keeping a persistent team chat going and that asynchronous communication is just a great way to have the team feel bonded. And they'll talk about personal and professional in that chat stream. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. And then for specific projects where it needs to be more formal, you can create those project chat streams that are separate. So having just that one team chat, I think is a really nice thing. And then the third thing, which is, of course, the hardest because it costs a lot more money, is bringing people together in person Mm -hmm. as often as you can. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, for us within the marketing team here at Fuse, we do that twice a year at a minimum. And we just did that this past week. It was wonderful. We had our sales kickoff and then we stayed together as a marketing team yesterday and had that time together, but just making sure that you're finding those opportunities and making that case for budget if you need to, to get the group together on on some sort of basis. And then the other thing that I think a lot of managers don't do that's a missed opportunity is when you're out in other cities for other types of work, whether you're out meeting with customers, you're at a conference, if you have an employee within striking distance, meet them. Even if there's no office there, go take them to coffee, take them to lunch, take them to dinner, take those opportunities. Don't just fly in and out. If you have employees in that region, find a way to go have a personal connection with them and, and meet face to face. So those yeah. are the things, those are kind of the three big ones that we've seen as we've been kind of experimenting here at Fuse, but also talking to our customers. All right. Today's growth story revolves around search engine marketing, and we'll be shining the spotlight on Aegis Software, a company that makes software for manufacturing operations. 
Aegis was one of the first companies in their space to invest in search marketing. But as competition grew, their performance plateaued. To counter this, they hired Directive Consulting, the B2B search marketing agency. With unparalleled experience in inbound lead gen for B2B companies, Directive was able to increase Aegis's monthly online leads by 457% while at the same time lowering their cost per lead by 147%. Now I have a hunch that Directive can get these kind of results for you too. So head over to directiveconsulting.com and request a totally free custom proposal. That's directiveconsulting.com. All right, let's get back to this interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you touched on something there, um, infusing time for, for personal human connections. I think it's in, you know, Simon Sinek's conversation on millennials that, that went viral, you know, a while back and he was talking about, you know, even with, uh, in-person meetings, you know, how we can be glued to our phones and there's not that interaction between people of, you know, Hey, how's it going? How's your dad? How, you know, how are the kids? Those sorts of conversations. So I think even more so carving out time or at least setting that that standard for allowing that even over conference calls and, and video meetings is very important. And then the other thing that you touched on that I really liked was uh, having the allowance or even some specific channels for for personal stuff on your communication or or your chat tool that you're using. We we started a random channel on our Slack chat where we ask a question of the day and and it's been a great way for people to get to know each other on our team. Um, and there's a lot of funny stuff, but I can also you know snooze my notifications there to where you know I'm only getting alerted to really pertinent matters if I'm having a really busy day or or something like that. So there are ways that we can leverage technology if we're very intentional about it to allow you know chat tools like fuse and, and other communication tools to bring us together and and not divide us which they can do if if we're not careful so I, I love what you're saying there um, and anything else you'd like to add on um, you know culture in a distributed organization you you know you've mentioned the power of video leaders leading by example we've talked about you know infusing personal touches in the communication and and then getting together in person when and where you can um, anything else you'd add to that I think the biggest thing culturally is is the idea of kind of thinking remote first and mm-hmm. that's something that we've been talking about for a while here I think that when you have a distributed team and you have some people in offices and we have, I mean, we have people in offices, we have people in co-working spaces, we have people remote. It's, it's a, a really broad mix right now that if everything you do, you think remote first on and that remote first employee experience, it'll actually be a better experience for everyone. So, you know, if we think about bringing a speaker into HQ who we love then why are we not thinking about the fact that we need to build that fuse experience and that video experience for everyone to be able to join that meeting? Or if we think about just our, even our company updates, we now do them three times so that every time zone where we have a critical mass of employees Mm -hmm. can have that experience at a rational time. And then of course Mm -hmm. there's the recording afterwards. But I think that if you can approach it from a culture standpoint, top down, where you say, and you make that, that conscious decision, we're going to be a company culture that does think remote first when we think about how we're building culture and how we're communicating, Mm -hmm. that a lot of those things will sort of naturally flow. So for instance, on the video calls, one of the things that will happen is if someone's not turning on their video, you'll ask them why they don't have their video on. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's in our culture. That's okay to ask that question. Mm -hmm. So if someone's video is not on, we'll say, you know, Hey, what's the deal? No video today. And the response may be, if it's my, if it's a colleague out in the West coast, it's 6 a.m., guys, and then we all laugh and we have a moment about it. You know, he's not going to, I understand why he's not turning his video on at 6 a.m., but we have permission to ask that question because the assumption is if we're getting together as a team, unless there's a compelling reason, your video should be on and I should not see you looking at your phone because there's accountability with my video on. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a lot harder to multitask when everyone can see my eyes darting around and looking down at my phone. So mm-hmm. I think that that culture standpoint of, if everyone in the entire company can think remote first, that will will naturally do a lot of the right things. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I, I love that. Just some very, very practical takeaways that I think people can can implement here um, that you've been sharing, Lisa. I, I love this topic. Um, I love the the thoughts that you're bringing to this conversation. I love how you guys are building a culture and, and building tools to help people with the way that we're working these days. So on that note, Lisa, if there's anyone listening to this that would like to follow up with you, stay connected, learn more about what you and the team at Fuse are doing these days, what's that? best way for them to reach out or find you guys? Sure. You can find me on LinkedIn, but also um, Fuse via email. So it's lwalker at fuse.com. And also, if you visit the Fuse website, all the data I've been talking about earlier is in a report that we call Workforce Futures. So you can stop by and grab a copy of that. I love it. We'll link to that uh, in the show notes as well. Lisa, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for your time today. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.